on YouTube. Cool. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, this is the week seven of the computational fabrication seminar. Uh, and today our topic is learning to CAD. Um, our motivational speaker today is Professor Jia Jun Wu from Stanford University. Um, Professor Wu is um, sorry, an assistant professor of computer science at Stanford University, working on computer vision, machine learning, and computational cognitive science. Before joining Stanford, he was a visiting faculty researcher at Google Research. He received his PhD in electrical engineering and computer science at Massachusetts Institute of Te Technology. Whose research has been recognized through the ACM Doctoral Dissertation Award, Honorable Mention, the Triple AI ACM Sick AI Doctoral Dissertation Award, MIT George M. Sprouse PhD thesis Award in Artificial Intelligence and Decision Making, the 2020 Samsung AI Researcher of the Year, the IROS Best Paper Award on Cognitive Robotics, and Faculty Research Awards and Graduate Fellowships from Samsung, Amazon, Facebook, and Media and Adobe. Uh, let's welcome Professor Wu for his uh, motivational talk today. Great. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me here. Very exciting to be part of um, this seminar series. Um, so I'm going to talk about, you know, from images to shapes to CAD models. Um, So you know, I think uh, our, we are already interested in connecting three D shapes and CAD models, right? That's why you know this seminar is about and um, at this time, this time. And so three D shapes, you know, usually you can represent it, especially if you get it directly from raw sensors. Then that's kind of meshes or points or scans. And you know, you may want to like, but the shapes have structures in there. You really want to understand and connect that with. You know, this is not really a CAD program, but you know, it's an example of you know what we want these representations could be, right? Capturing things like repetitions, capturing the regularities in objects. And our goal is, you know, is it really for possible for us to effectively connect them automatically, ideally with very minimal supervision, right? So the problem here is, um, you know, can we actually do this kind of inference? Uh, for like getting these 3D CAD models or programs from the raw shapes. But there's a related problem, which is also very important. It turned out, you know, it actually may really contribute to inference. That is the problem of execution, right? If you have a 3D CAD models, how can you translate that into, into a raw shape? Or this may sound straightforward, but you will see that I can actually, you know, there, there are important innovations that we can make there as well to actually facilitate the inference problem, which seems to be what we really care about. So the problem is, is um, is it's there for a really long time and recently there has been some interesting uh, progress right for example there has been uh, impressive optimization based methods like inverse csg like from mit where you know you can actually get a shape and you can infer uh, the rather complex you know um, csg from these raw shapes and you know at the same time there is uh, this uh, learning based methods like called for example like csg net where they try to do it from umass where they uh, try to do uh, inferring a CSG or parse programs for raw input images or even 3D shapes um, uh, using a learning based methods by training on the data sets. And now you can test it very quickly um, to produce the, the programs you want from input images or shapes. So you can see that there's kind of an interesting, I would say, contrast between these two types of methods because the optimization based methods, uh, they seem to be working on much more complex objects and shapes. But at the same time, right, because they're doing, in some sense, they're doing, there's no learning, right? There's only optimization during test time. So it takes a long time for them to, to search and get this right answer from the input. Or the learning based methods, in some sense, you can see they're doing like amortized inference because they have seen a lot of examples. They amortize the training cost into the learning cost, uh, the inference cost into the training time. Therefore, during testing, you only need uh, a free forward, right, over these newer free forward paths over these neural networks. So the inference can be done very efficiently. Um, but the the complexity, right, of the of the input data they are dealing with is so much less compared with the complexity of data that those optimization methods are dealing with. And, you know, the objects and the images here are just so much simpler. So is that possible for us to get the best of both worlds, right? Can we actually use learning? That's the topic of uh, the theme of this seminar. And can we use learning to connect the 3D shapes and the CAT models? Um, 
And um, so that hopefully, you know, you can do it very fast, but also, you know, can we find ways to really let our learning method do better so that they can do uh, deal with uh, very complex scenes and objects and shapes. Um, so how can these learning methods do better, right? How can we help them to do better? I think there are four things that we may want to consider. And the first thing is, you know, can you really have to build on large scale data sets? Right. So uh, a challenge in uh, those early learning based methods and the reason that why they only work on simpler scenes is because that's all the data they have. Right. To learn, you need to train and learn from the data sets. And if your all data set is all kind of simple geometric previous, then the only thing you can do and you can learn to solve are the same level of data of the same level of complexity. So it's exciting that recently there has been a lot of progress. For example, this Autodesk Fusion 3D Gallery is one example of, of these kind of Kind of CAD model data set. You have raw shapes, but also at the same time, right? You have annotations on you know how these shapes are, are made, the CAD models for them, uh, like you know sketches, extrude, and those kind of operations. And hopefully, you know, by having and it also has a wide range of objects of different complexities. But I feel like you know if we really keep pushing for um, more and more complex data over a wide range of objects, then that would be really like the basis, you know, because in some sense a lot of these learning methods or the key then to make things work is like the big, big, big data. And the second thing that I think we may want to need and understand is the fast and very scalable inference algorithm, right? Because the problem of searching the CAD, pro the CAD model or CAD program, they're in inherently a discrete uh, representation. And searching, optimizing for this discrete, discrete representation is really, really hard. And you know, neural networks are most successful in dealing with things like continuous representations. And when output structure, you know, input structure can be very complex, like an image or point clouds, but the output structure is usually very simple. Um, so like, you know, image classification labels. So now if you want your inference algorithm to output very complex things like a program or cat models, you know, how would you deal with that, right? You need to come up with uh, scalable inference algorithms. You know, for example, uh, you know, some of the inference may be guided by neural networks. You know, you may learn to, instead of, you know, just directly search and, you know, you may, instead of directly using neural networks to output a final shape or cat models, you know, you may actually use neural networks in different ways. For example, as some heuristics to optimize or to accelerate your optimization process, right? This, uh, I think there are a lot of recent works, for example, this one from Braun, uh, using neural networks to guide uh, the inference procedures, right? Instead of directly using neural networks itself as inference engines, you can put them together, uh, integrate them with optimization-based methods. And another thing that you know, I think for CAT modeling we care about is, you know, sometimes you, you wonder, you know, the objects are not only made of these very simple shapes, right? But what are the raw elements you know, that that really the the entry level primitives that we really care that that really are the elements that make together these shapes. Uh, so, for example, the shapes may not be only like cylinders or cubes or cuboids. You know, shape the shape is, the shape itself. For example, a chair may have some decorations, and these kind of things are, you know, possibly hard to capture. So. No, I think there has been some recent exciting progress from the program synthesis committee. Uh, you know, at the same time, when you can do things like library learning, where you're not only at the same time learning to infer what the program or the model should be like, but also at the same, also you know, learning how these entry level primitives can be represented, as well as how these uh, learned programs or models can be compressed, right, so that you can effectively synthesize and imagine more complex programs. Um, so that would be, I think, a nice complement to the the. The, the pure innovations on the algorithm on the inference algorithm side, right? So we want to put together innovations from you know deep learning as well as um, standard uh, optimization methods, but also think about you know maybe if there are some innovations from the current synthesis, synthesis community, then we can borrow and put them together as well. And third type of innovation that is, you know, we want to not only focus on the inference algorithms themselves, but also think about the execution uh, process. Now, it might be straightforward that saying, okay, we already have a CAC program, of course, you know, we can produce a shape out of it. Uh, but if you want to really put them into loop, you know, having this optimization or rendering or execution in the loop of your inference algorithms, especially in these days, a lot of them are neural networks that requires differentiability, then can you actually build things like differentiable execution engines? For example, right, Adrian's group had this recent work on uh, integrating and building differentiable 3D CAT models, right? So, you know, there in, in this paper, you know, they come up with this kind of new differentiable CAT processing of 3D CAD programs, and they show that you can use it for optimization, right? But of course, you can also think about how this type of system, once you have there, like a differential execution engine, you can put them together with an inference network so that you can not only do up, like gradient-based optimization, but you can also leverage them, especially, you know, put them together with inference algorithms and train them on large-scale data set so that you can do um, those kind of the inference of 3D CAD models in a much more efficient way during testing. Right, so we can think about ways, you know, 
is there possible for us to put together these differentiable execution engines with inference algorithms? And we also had earlier work where we tried to do you know, convert shape pro, uh, three shapes into programs, not really CAD models, but like, like this kind of program-like representation. Or back then, we are, because we don't really have a differentiable program executor, right? So the way we thought about to make a differentiable is we just execute it with a neural network, right? So you can put together a neural network executor with a neural network program synthesizer or program generator. And it turned out that on this particular shape from a specific language, it actually does pretty good. For example, if you have an image like this, and you know, if you just do some raw 3D reconstruction in the space of you know, point clouds or meshes, then you can see the reconstruction is okay, but if you compare, uh, especially from the input view, but if you compare the top of the objects, right, looking at from a different view, then you realize this, you know, these kind of raw 3D reconstruction methods where they represent 3D uh, shapes into point clouds or meshes or voxels, they don't really consider the regularities where humans really have and we really have when we are making or fabricating those objects. But if you're representing them into like CAD model or program-like representations, then you can actually do much better. And this is possible because back then we don't have a differentiable program executor. So we have to realize these and execute the programs and inference the, and infer the programs all using neural networks. And finally, as I said in the title, right, from images to shapes to CAD models, you know, a large challenge we have here is, you know, we don't have large scale data sets and there are some progress there, but hopefully we'll have more. Uh, but, you know, fundamentally, it's just much harder to annotate anything like shapes and parts and regularities uh, and compare with the large amount of data we have in 2D, right? There's just infinite number, almost infinite number of internet images. You can search, if you search typing chair, you can get millions of images of chair. And these are like very rich and you can get a lot of sketches as well. And these are very rich uh, source of data and contains a huge variety or you can, almost, of course you have a picture of every possible chair, but you don't have the 3D annotations, not even CAD models, but you don't sometimes, a lot of times you don't even have the 3D shapes of object, right? So there's a lot of challenge in leveraging and using these 2D images as data sources. But if we can really find a way to use them, then it will greatly enrich um, the type of data we can deal with and also you know, make our model um, to do things that we cannot do before with the annotation of 3D CAD models, because it's almost impossible to imagine that we will have you know, the level uh, annotation at, at the CAD model level for the images we have, uh, for, for all the objects we have where we have their 2D images. So the benefit of that is the data will be no longer limited and we we'll probably know some things have too many, not few, too few data points. But of course, images are hard to work with because you know, that's why the whole, there's the whole field of computer vision. Right. So uh, to try to connect images to shapes, not even to CAD models, just to connect images to shapes, there's a problem of, for example, like 3D reconstruction, which is really challenging because of occlusion, lining, and then kind of parameters. And you know, if you want to go further toward CAD models and programs, there's no ground truth annotations of any of these, right? Almost. Um, so Recently, there has been a very popular field and a lot of advances in connecting 2D images and 3D shapes by, for example, uh, methods like inverse rendering and neural rendering with, for example, NERF as an example. And of course, there has been now hundreds of follow-ups where they had to improve NERF in different ways. Um, so we thought, is that possible for us, you know, also, you know, leveraging efficient inference and differential executors, but here, you know, now not executing programs into shapes, uh, but putting them together with neural and inverse rendering methods where you can connect 3D shapes further to 2D images so that you can do some level of you know, self-supervised learning directly from 2D images, but then you not only get the 3D shapes, but also get some CAD model representations. Um, so here's an example where it has nothing to do with CAD models, but I just use an example where I try to show that some of recent work where we can actually derive a program-like representation for even 3D objects from a single image. And hopefully eventually we can turn that into a CAD model representation. And here from this image, you can see there's some clear regularity or program-like representations for the serials, right, um, in, in, in bow. And we leverage methods on like internal learning to, discovering, uh, to discover repeated objects in the image. And once you have that, in some sense, you are vectorized the image because you no longer deal with the complex textures and you're now just dealing with this kind of, you know, sort of symbolic representations. And you can run things like program synthesis on top of it so that you can get a program-like representation for input image like this, what entry-level primitives, like what these objects are, like, you know, sitting there or whatever, now is represented by a neural network as a patch. And by having this kind of program representation for images, you can actually do things like you know, in painting, but smart in painting because you have to understand there is regularities in image. You can do things like extrapolation, like extrude, but now you do extrapolation by adding another column of serials, as well as you know, changing or adding regularities by magnifying the regularity in irregularities, magnifying the irregularities in this image. <clears throat> 
And we also try to do it in 3D in the sense that you can come up with this kind of program-like representations. Now, again, this is not really like a cat model, and this is like more generally for scenes for different planes. But I wouldn't be surprised if we really be able to connect new inverse and newer rendering methods with the, um, some uh, efficient inference algorithms and, and ideally differentiable program executors will be able to do all these from raw images of objects that you can do all the way to cat models. And the benefit of having these kind of program representations for cat models is you can do efficient editing. And having that for images is of course, you can also do similarly efficient editing that you cannot do before with purely neural networks. For example, if I give you this image and ask you how the scene will look like if you turn around, Right. This is like a corridor, so you can't really know what is in the back. But you know, if you have to make a guess among infinite number of possible explanations, then I would say maybe one possible explanation I would choose is this would be like an infinite corridor because I expect you know the, the the lights would have to repeat themselves. You know, of course, there's no real infinite corridors, but this will be like one possible explanation if I have to choose from things I don't know. And here's a demo of you know what our methods can do, leveraging those kind of program-based representations that you can actually really synthesize an infinite corridor with the light repeating themselves. If you look at standard, you know, general novel view synthesis methods, then they can still do something. But you know, once they go to the back where they have no knowledge of you know what what the scenes should look like, then they can only predict just blank things, right? So that's what I feel like, you know, the, the program presence is of course really helpful powerful, but if you can really connect them to the rich sources in 2D, data sources in 2D, then you can do much more. Okay, so to summarize, right? So if we want to really learn to connect 3D shapes and cat models, you know, a few thoughts I have is we really want to do, um, to collect large scale and carefully annotated data sets if possible. Of course, it's expensive, but you know, to the extent that we can. And we want to develop efficient inference algorithms, you know, by thinking about, for example, like library learning, those kind of techniques from program synthesis community as well. We want to build differential program execution units because we can now uh, not only use them for optimization based, you know, gradient based optimization, but we can also really pair them with those inference algorithms, which are, especially if you can parameterize and implement them using neural networks, then you can do end to end learning in some sense, like, you know, in a self supervised way. And further, this kind of self supervised learning can happen not only at the level of uh, 3D shapes, but can also, you know, happen at the level of 2D images if possible, um, because there has been a lot of advances recently in neural inverse renderings. And now I feel like, especially at the ultra level, this is not impossible. And 2D images are just so much richer. So if we can, but th they are not annotated. So if we can leverage this kind of rich and annotated data sources by using all these, putting all these techniques together for self supervised learning, then I, have, I feel like this field is to have a lot of potential. Um, yeah, so that's it, thank you. Thank you very much for the exciting talk. Um, okay, so now we will welcome our uh, um, speaker, next speaker today, uh, Ben Jones, um, who will tell us more about uh, his work uh, on Automate. Uh, yeah, so I will give an introduction of Ben. Ben is a PhD student at the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington advised by Professor Adriana Schultz. Um, he studies computational fabrication and human AI interaction. Uh, his research interests include inverse problem and tools for creative problem solving. Prior to joining the University of Washington, he earned a bachelor's degree in physics and joint mathematics and computer science from Harvey Mudd College. In his capstone project, he helped develop a wireless um, power transmission array for space-based solar power. He's in prototype distributed systems for web analytics at Quantcast and later worked on computational imaging in the biophotonics lab at Caltech. Um, so Ben, please uh, take it away. Thank you for the introduction, each one. So um, when I saw the topic for today's seminar, it kind of got me thinking. So. What does it mean to learn to CAD? It's a cute title, no doubt, but a little bit unspecific. Um, CAD is a really expansive engineering discipline with hundreds of subtopics. So what is it like we're really trying to learn to do? So before we can figure out what it means to learn to CAD, I think we need to take a step back and decide, really, um, what does it mean to CAD? It's such an overloaded term, uh, sometimes referring to a type of geometric model, sometimes to the tools used to construct those models, and sometimes to the act of building them. 
So here's the plan for the day. I'm going to start with some philosophical musings and kind of figure out, you know, what, what is CAD? Um, from there, we can look at how CAD is used in practice to figure out what we're going to learn. Uh, we'll then do a bit of a deep dive onto the technical meat, the CAD data structures that we're going to be trying to learn over, um, then show an example application for a common CAD uh, task, which is mating tasks together, and then talk a little bit about uh, where to go next. So CAD, uh, we oftentimes just say, oh, I'm gonna CAD that. So what, what does the verb form of this venerable acronym even mean? I think, uh, you know, expand that out. It's, it's a good starting point as any. So let's take a look at it. Uh, computer aided design. Uh, for me, there are two important parts here. Um, design is the relevant action, uh, not modeling or drawing, but uh, design, inherently creative and iterative process of taking a concept and uh, refining and realizing it. Um, so in this process, where do the computers come in? Well, they're an aid. So there's two parties at work here, there's the machine and the designer. And I think that since human intent is integral to the process of design, it's not that work that we're trying to point machine learning at. We want our machines to learn to be better at aiding human designers. So what is CAD? The CAD is to create a model of a physical object with the assistance of a computer program. I think uh, if we wanna know how to help in this, we should probably look at what these computer programs currently do. So let's take a look at what a typical uh, CAD program looks like when a user is trying to construct an object. So they're gonna start out by sketching a bunch of shapes and extruding them. We're going to um, do this by clicking on existing shapes like this and ex executing operations in relation to these with certain parameters. And they're going to iteratively do this until as they build the shape from the ground up. And sometimes they're going to use things like looping structures here to repeat features. And in addition to just defining geometry like this, sometimes they will also specify how different pieces of geometry relate. So here we have a bunch of different parts. And in just a second, this user is gonna create some parts and define how these things can interact with each other. And finally, we see their end product, which is a model of how these things can move relative to each other, which was their goal in the first place. So this was a relatively fast overview. So let's break it down. What was the core loop of what the user was doing here? Well, the first thing they were doing was getting up here and they're selecting a tool. Uh, in this example, an extrude tool. Next, they are choosing some parameters for what that tool is gonna do. Uh, these have two kinds. They're visual parameters where they're interacting directly with the visualization of the model. And then some numerical, pad, numerical or enumerative parameters that they are usually indicating in some sort of dialogue. And finally down at the bottom here, Every time they're selecting one of these, this, this line is growing. And this is their command history that is kind of showing. What were the steps that were used to build up this model? And so when I look at this, this tells me that I think CAD is visual programming. So up here, these tools are really instructions. They are they're program statements. Parameters are selecting if they're on the model. These are usually reference parameters, or from these dialogues, they're usually value parameters. And this timeline of instructions that the user has performed is a visualization of a program listing. You don't see in here explicitly uh, what we usually expect to see um, if we look at you know, code we're used to with looping structures and stuff, but th those are hidden in there, kind of collapsed into individual commands to make it look linear. But this is telling us that as, as we've seen before, CAD is a program, but the users who construct CAD programs aren't usually looking at it that way. They're usually looking at it as this interactive design tool. And there's one last part here that I think is really important, but not necessarily pointed out, which is that the picture of the model itself is a description of the current program state. 
which makes this a, a kind of interesting programming paradigm in that you are constantly going and referring back to the current state of execution as you are coding. So that's going to be in my philosophical musings. I think CAD is uh, visual programming, but in practice, what do we want to learn in this? Let's zoom out. We have our CAD program's code, and then we have this visualized state, which is in the form of a data structure called a boundary representation. We'll go into more details about that later. And this core design loop that users are going through is selecting operations, editing the code to bed, seeing how the state changes, making a new decision, and repeating as the design builds up. And this all goes towards realizing some application. In this case, the application was trying to simulate how these set of parts interact. So, as with a most optimization, uh, the natural target is the core loop. We want to make this core design loop easier for a designer. Um, and there are two key objects in this loop. There's the code created by the designer that specifies the design. And then there's this intermediate program state that the designer is using for feedback and to make references in the program specification. So I'm going to argue that this latter object is what we want to focus our attention on. So firstly, it's generally closer to the design intent shows what the object looks like. And it's also closer to what the designers are thinking in terms of. And secondly, it's actually more generic across CAD systems. And so let's look at that second point. So looking back at our CAD workflow, we have this abstraction of you know, CAD code. But what is CAD code? Well, it turns out that on basically every CAD system in existence, it's got its own custom language. So if we target code generation, it will always be specific to some particular system. And on the application side, this varies widely too. In our other example, we were targeting a simulation of camshafts, but designers can also model to target rendering or fabrication among many, many other examples. Um, and the design choices they make along the way will be informed also by the target application. For example, how they choose to model joints or if they do it all, um, if they model material properties, or if they're gonna model internal details of a model or, or an object. So looking at this landscape, we see that the state of the representation, this parametric boundary representation, are the only constant across CAD systems and tasks. And the industry knows this. Uh, unlike practically any other programming system, the standard exchange form between CAD systems isn't the code. It's actually um, this internal state representation, this data structure that contains none of the program structure nor any task-specific data, just shape representations. This also means that it'll be the most commonly available type of data for us to learn with. So there's actually a lot of this out there. So how do we assist? So my idea of where we should be targeting CAD learning for helping CAD designers is as a kind of suggestion tool. So now this loop looks like this. We break it down. You're going to make a decision, usually you know, applying some, some function in the tool. This is going to change the code, update the state. Now this is where we're going to sneak in. We're going to learn some representation of the state and use that representation to predict a suggestion of what to do next or how to complete the implementation. So this is the plan. In order to do this, uh, we kind of need to understand more about what these data structures are, what these parametric boundary representations are. We want to understand how to do learning on them. So first, why DREPs? Why, why does CAD use these, these data structures? Why not something more common like, like meshes, for example? Well, I think the biggest reason is arbitrary precision. These sorts of data structures um, represent shapes as parametric equations at the lowest level. And so they can be uh, realized to any sort of arbitrary precision, which is really important for manufacturing tolerances. And it also allows them to capture both smooth and sharp geometry. They also explicitly represent the referenceable entities, which is important for this programming paradigm. You need to be able to reference specifically, I want to extrude this space or I want to chamfer this edge. Let's go into more detail about what these BREPs are and how this is achieved. So parametric boundary representations splits a shape into four types of topological entities. We've got faces, edges, vertices, and loops of edges. 
These entities have associated parametric geometry functions. For example, the equation of a circle, a line, or a point, and also topological relationships between these entities to determine their final geometry. So loops bound and clipped faces, edges are made up, loops make up the edges, and vertices bound the edges. So what is the kind of natural data structure to represent these? Well, these topological relations form a natural graph structure. So let's replace each of these entities with some node. And then we can draw an edge from each bounding entity to the entity that it bounds. So loops that cut up a face, an edge between those, et cetera. So the parameter geometry information is stored in the nodes and all the boundary information is conveyed by edges that fully define the shape. So if we have a graph structure and we're trying to learn something on this, the natural um, technique that has been pretty popular the last few years is to use the message passing networks or graph convolutional networks. But what kind do we need to use here? So let's look at our learning requirements. Our goal is going to be to learn embeddings for each of the topological entities in the theorem for use in dodging learning tasks. And for this, we're gonna have two main criteria. The first is going to be to handle all four types of topology. So there have been previous GCNs for BREPs that have used uh, simplified BREP graphs with just face nodes and edge links. Um, for some tasks and for general CAT tests, this is insufficient because you can actually reference any sort of entity. You might want to reference a loop, for example, to um, talk about a void in a face. Um, or you might want to reference a corner as a vertex. And the second main requirement is we need to capture as wide of a receptive field as possible in order, in order to understand the local geometry. Because these are actually end up being pretty big graphs that have a pretty wide distribution of sizes. So what are the challenges involved in this? Well, this first property means that our graphs are inherently heterogeneous, which is a problem because this makes uh, GCNs very memory intensive and difficult to learn, especially on the large kind of graphs we're gonna see. And because we have large graphs, we want to capture a wide receptive field. We need uh, a deep convolutional network because in these kinds of networks, every hop, every time you want to increase your receptive field, you need another layer. Um, and GCNs are traditionally notorious that they build a train past three or four layers, which, as we will see, barely scratches the surface on BREP graphs and here size. So we have uh, constructed an architecture to address both these problems. And our insight here is that this graph is actually hierarchical. So they're not arbitrary heterogeneous graphs. There's a distinct layered structure. If we gather the nodes by the topological type and arrange them into four layers, vertices, edges, loops, and faces, oh, we notice the edges only exist between the adjacent layers. So this will let us convert expensive heterogeneous message passing scheme into a series of simpler homogeneous passes. So in the architecture we're proposing to capture these heterogeneous BREPs is what we call the structured BREP GCN or SPGCN. So as our input, we'll take the structured graph with node features of parametric function and their arguments along with any sort of uh, computer geometrical properties we want from the CAD kernel, such as surface area, the length, or the center of mass of these spaces, edges, et cetera. We will embed these input features into a common space and then pass messages up. Because this is a hierarchical system, um, we know that all, only the lower dimensional entities have any information about boundaries of higher dimensional entities. So we'll start with an upwards set of message passing layers um, in order to allow this to go, to be trained on deep networks, we're gonna use um, residuals. So uh, there's some residual um, message passing layers. Um, there's been some work, well, that has shown that these can allow uh, GCNs to be trained actually fairly deeply. Then the next problem that we talked about was that these are really big graphs. And one of the main culprits here is that um, the path between just adjacent faces um, geometrically is actually quite long. You go from faces to loops to edges, back to loops to faces. And so geometric proximity actually 
uh, size one really has a kind of a topological uh, complexity of size four. So what we're going to introduce is metapath. So we're going to have shortcut all of these kind of local uh, nodes that are just defining boundary relationships because we just collected that information and just pass from face to face. So we add a set of these meta edges from face to face. We have a backbone that pass images around there to get neighborhood information. And then to pass neighbor dimension back down to the individual topological entities that are boundaries, we will pass those back down in another cascading layer. So this officially produces embedding vectors for each type of topologi topological entity that captures information from a wide receptive field and satisfies all the requirements for representation learning on BR topologies. So that's a bit about um, what term computer apps are and how we propose to learn on them. So I'm going to go into an example application just mating. So this is uh, we're working from Secret Asia last year. Um, it's me and uh, Dalton Hildreth, Duan Chen, Elia Braun, uh, Vova Kim, and Adriana. So let's go back to your definition here. You said that to CAD is to create a model of a physical object with the assistance of a computer problem program. Um, so let's look at uh, these models in the word depth. So if we remember from our example earlier, we didn't just have one part. There were several parts that were modeled by the user and these all had relations to each other. So CAD models are really assemblies of parts uh, that define both the geometry of digital parts and also the relative positions and degrees of freedom of pairs of parts that combine to create the complex motions you can see here. So, how are assemblies usually made? Let's look at the assembly process in more detail. So designer selects command, and has to navigate to the parts to select individual references to define this mate, and then specify additional parameters, generally through dialogues, until they get the part relationship they want. Uh, these part relationships are called mates, and creating them requires careful positioning of parts in reference to one another, as well as specification of how these parts can move relative to one another. It's a time-consuming, tedious, and airflow and manual process, which in practice makes up about a third of the modeling time. So we would like to help with this as a computer aid. <laughs> so here's what we're proposing. Uh, in contrast, we're proposing an automatic make suggestion tool. So in our tool, the user just selects the parts they want to make and rough locations on them. And our system suggests a few different mate locations and articulation type so that the user can uh, the design as well. To understand how to mate parts, we first need to understand their makeup. So a mate in CAD is a constraint between two parts, which defines how they can be positioned relative to each other. There isn't a single standard for how to build these constraints. So in our system, we define mates by a pair of mating coordinate frames, uh, one in each part. So in this example, the frames are the center of these hinges and circles. When these parts are mated, their frames are constrained to be coincident. However, we also need to specify the functionality of this hinge. They can open and close. So we allow a Z rotational degree of freedom. So in our system, eight types of motion are allowed. We call this the mate type. So you can fasten parts in place. You can revolve them around the Z axis, slide along the Z axis, uh, planar translation X and Y, spherical ball joints, and common combination of these rotational and translational degrees of freedom. So how do you define these frames? So to ensure a proper mechanical function, the mating coordinate frames need to be defined to the same precision as parametric geometry. And to achieve this, the cabinets are defined in reference to the topological entities. So let's see how this works in the context of the engineering. So zooming in on the pin, look at the, the B-Rep graph around this point. We want to place a mating coordinate frame at the center of the pin. So to do this, we'll need two references. One is to the inner circle, specifying that the origin of the coordinate frame is at the center of the circle. That's a location. And the other one is to the planar face on top of the hinge pin, which is specifying that the coordinate frame is oriented to normal to the face. This shows how parts would be relatively oriented to each other. So what do we do with this? Well, we're proposing to build a recommender system. And so that can, fit within existing CAD assembly workflows. So when creating an assembly, whenever the user selects faces on two parts, 
our system uses these selections to generate a collection of potential mates. And then uses SBGCN to score and rank these mates, the top 60 which are presented to the user. So the first step of the system is the generation of potential mates. So recall the uh, mate is the relationship between two mating coordinate frames, each of which is defined in reference to two topological entities. So a potential mate needs four topological references. Uh, when the user selects faces on two parts, we use these selections to choose both the parts to be mated, as well as a collection of Uh, as well as the orientation. So uh, for potential mates, we also need the, the coordinate frame origins. So we we'll assume these to be near the user selection. This is how we capture the user intent. And so we find all the locations which are topologically adjacent to the selected faces and create potential mates using all of the pairwise combinations. This can result in very, very many potential mates. So we need to reduce these suggestions before the user. Here's where the learning comes in. So we treat this as a ranking problem and use the Siamese network with SBGCN to create features for each potential mate. And then a fully, a simple fully connected network scores each of these. Uh, these are ranked in the top six and present the user. And if the user selects one, another fully connected network is class for the mate type. So that's kind of overview of the system, but how do we train this? What do we use to do it? Well, before this work, there wasn't really any existing large scale data set for assembly modeling with CAD geometry. Uh, so we made one. So to one animate parts, we scraped and cleaned all of the publicly available sets in Onshape, which is a free to use uh, browser-based CAD system. Um, and we've released this open source. You can go online and download it now. Um, so this dataset has nearly 100,000 unique assemblies, over 500,000 unique mates, and about 380,000 unique uh, BREP parts. So it is quite a hefty collection. Let's talk about how does this, how, how does this work? So we evaluated our system in, in two ways. One is in mate location. So figuring out where the parts should come together. And then also evaluated, did we get the type of motion correct? So let's start with the mate location. So what do our predictions look like? So here the user has selected a bracket face and the end of some complicated aluminum extrusion. Um, from these two selections, our system generates over 7,500 potential mates. Uh, and here are the top six in its rankings. So for the most part, our system wanted to align the circular bolt holes in each part. Um, and in our data set, the two parts are actually made into like this fourth prediction. The ranking position of our mates in our data set is our primary evaluation metric. Uh, if you aggregate across all the mates in our test set, um, we look at the, the hit ratio at K predictions, which is the percentage of examples that would predict the correct mate within the first K options we plotted here. Our system gets the correct mate first on just over 40% of the time. And since we show six selections to the user, the accuracy of our UI is the hit ratio at six or 72.2%. And for context, a random ranking would work only 30% of the times. And as a baseline, if we don't use CAD data, we use uh, traditional assembly modeling techniques from the literature, like representing points as part clouds and regressing relative positions. Um, we do uh, something that works. Uh, for this, we use three popular point cloud networks, uh, point cloud, point net, point net plus plus, and dynamic graph CNN. Um, and they do not approach the accuracy of using CAD data. So why is this? Uh, let's look at how the baseline predictions are made. Uh, first, we pre-aligned the parts, the center selected faces, so when you predict these offsets. We then snapped to the nearest mating frame as generated by our system. Um, for ranking, we sorted by distance in the offsets. Um, and the top bracket here gives us a hint as to what is happening. There are many frame locations clustered near to a predicted offset, so even small errors can generate inconsistent selection. So to quantify this, we tried ground truth offsets with increasing amounts of noise. Um, and here we plot a ranking metric against our noise magnitude. So with perfect predictions, the system performs optimally, but very quickly drops off with just small amounts of noise. Um, and this experiment really is just highlighting the need to use CAD data formats for CAD mating. Uh, other structures just do not offer the necessary precision to make exact predictions needed for mechanical modeling. So now let's look at the mate type task. Uh, these predictions are made assuming that the correct mate location is already chosen. So our system gets the correct mate type just over 70% of the time. Um, for reference, uh, baseline ranking mate type, especially by their frequency in the data set is roughly 62% when accurate. 
Uh, we also ran the same 3D point cloud baselines, and our system still outperforms these, but not by as much in the location task. However, our model is far more efficient at this task than the point cloud models. It is only 126,000 parameters, whereas the point cloud models are between 834,000 and 1.5 million parameters. Uh, it also turns out their model is about on par with human performance. Uh, this is because mating is ambiguous. Uh, suppose you're choosing a mate type for these bricks. If they're in a wall, you might consider them to be fastened in place, or you may wish to model, model that they can slide apart, or maybe show that there is initially a rotation around this peg. So to quantify this ambiguity, uh, we asked seven CAD experts to manually label the parts in our test set and measure the pairwise agreement between parts using uh, Cohen's Kappa. Uh, this is zero on scale, and the median pair of experts has an agreement of uh, just 0.4, I meaning there's a high level of disagreement. Uh, we also measured agreement between experts and our data set, which had an even lower agreement. But interestingly, the median human expert is exactly on par with our model's predictions and label agreement, indicating the model is doing about as well as humans can at this task. Uh, there's also ambiguity in mate location. Consider uh, the location example we looked at earlier. Our model predicted the label position fourth, uh, but all of the top four suggestions look reasonable, aligning bolt holes between parts. Um, so we also asked a CAD expert to label which of our predictions were reasonable. That is, there is a context, a modeling context, in which that suggestion would be useful. Uh, these are indicated by these green check marks. Uh, all of our top predictions were good predictions, just not in the case, not, not in the use case that we have in the labeled data set. Um, this is a fairly common pattern, like this case or this one. So the accuracy numbers we showed earlier are best thought of as a lower bound. So this ambiguity motivates future work for us. So where to next? So zooming in on that last example in context, we see that the choice of holes to align with was dictated by the context that there's a motor mounting there, which we did not tell our system about. Uh, we'd like to incorporate uh, more parts into assembly context when producing mates. Um, uh, Complementing that uh, to adding assembly context, um, we'd also would like to further explore interaction techniques to capture design intents in ambiguous settings. Um, I'd like to point out also that uh, since this work was published, there has been uh, work in other groups that has addre addressed this and looked at modeling and context and modeling following meeting for full assemblies of time to fairly good results. Um, and, uh, finally, we'd like to incorporate more intrinsic geometric features. Um, so concurrently developed BREP graph networks do a pretty good job of this and generally follow the same convolutional pattern as the Metapath portion of SVGCM. So they're good candidates to incorporate into our structure to get both their benefits of explicit representing geometry and our network's benefits of being able to represent um, heterogeneous uh, types of topological entities. And I wanted to end by pointing out this observation that we kept coming back to, which is that CAD design is ambiguous, which I think comes down to the fact that design is inherently ambiguous and depends on the context of the designer's intent. So in the mating task, we had an ambiguity of how to use a pair of parts. Um, but if we uh, remember back out to the CAD workflow diagram we saw earlier, and look at like maybe a, a code generation task. We have an ambiguity there in that many different programs can represent exactly the same ge geometry, the same object. Uh, which program we want usually depends on the um, mind. So with that, I want to thank you all for your time and open up for questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Ben, for the deep dive into CAD programming. Uh, now we enter the QA session of our seminar today. Um, please feel free to enter your questions in the YouTube chat. Uh, we have a few questions for the CAD work, Ben's work. Uh, so with the thesis of CAD being visual programming, do you think there are ideas or advances in things like what you see is what you get editors or live programming environments that would be applicable in this domain? Oh, yeah, 100%. So direct editing, I think, is and is a very natural interact and you actually do see um, some commercial programs starting to incorporate things like um, having multiple editing modes where you can use commands or you can do some things like uh, dragging bases etc um, i think that uh, in terms of in incorporating learning into this um, a, lot, a lot of these systems kind of kind of work on, on, on things like, like heuristics right now and being able to look at you know, large scale databases especially if we can start getting databases that have the construction history 
uh, we can start looking at um, what sort of edits tend to happen in contact with each other and then um, kind of propagating these direct edits again versus um, you know, instead of just trying to do one direct edit at a time. So I think, I think there's a lot of kind of synergy that can happen. Between those two. That makes sense. Um, so Heisen has a question. Uh, he says, there are many other CD representation for learning as such as OS, OC tree, voxel-based representation, projection images, implicit surfaces. Is that possible to use uh, those methods for learning as well? Um, yeah, so that's actually something that I, I have been exploring. I think that we still want to have this un underlying backbone of the parameter figure up because it does um, course, it is like on the, I, I call it like the program state, but I also think that like the intermediate representation of this CAD language. So we wanna you know, keep this compatibility with the existing systems when you use this, but there's nothing stopping us from using those representations um, as, a, as a, a way to represent the geometry. So you know, the geometry is currently represented as parametric functions, but you could replace that representation with, you know, an SDF or with an octa representation. And that, that is exactly what some of these other works are doing. Um, so like, for example, uh, UV, UVNet, which is another way of um, learning features for BRAP faces, um, essentially represents the faces as uh, grid samples. Um, and so you can imagine you know, using something more complex like this octree sampling for that. Okay. So Amy has another question. Are planner and parallel mates meaningful? It's, it's like two of the eight types of mates that you show. Yeah, so that, that's actually an interesting question. So um, planar mates can sometimes be meaningful uh, on their own, but oftentimes are meaningful in context. So mates generally, like uh, more generally represent constraints between parts. And if you have more than one constraint, you can you can create like more complex types. And that's where planers usually fall in um, online. And uh, in my experience, parallel mates are fairly non-physical, but can define design intent. Uh, so an example of where I have used one recently, I was modeling a monitor arm system and I wanted to have the monitor, no matter where you move the monitor arm, always face forward to the user. So I would you know, represent it as a parallel, as a parallel mate saying, hey, the plane of the user's eyesight is always parallel to this structure. So it's not representing a physical constraint, it's representing a design intent constraint, which you know, again gets back to the ambiguity. Are we, when we're modeling these mating systems, are we trying to model the physical system, how it works? Are we trying to model the user's design intent? Um, which is, again, I think why we always are going to need a user model here. That makes a lot of sense. So um, actually also on the idea of ambiguity, um, both I guess in like general, like referring, inferring shape programs and also like designing things for, with CAD, there are always like ambiguities because you could use different programs that could generate the same design. Um, so I'm wondering, um, both of the speakers today, um, for example, in the if we want to use data from 2D images, what are the annotations that would be useful for disambiguating um, the programs that lead to the same design? Or like in CAD, potentially you could use um, the motions of the built mechanism to disambiguate the main types as well. So I'm wondering what are your thoughts on the kind of data that would help disambiguate um, the ambiguities in the design. Um, so I guess I, I can start um, from, you, you mentioned um, kind of the motions. I think, um, especially from, from images, have, having more, more than one image would be, would be pretty useful there. Um, you could also think about doing something kind of hybrid, right? Where you have a smaller collection maybe of models that have motion involved and a lot more images and kind of try to match up you know, what, you know, if I see an image of a gear, I don't necessarily need to see it moving and, and rotating to know that gears should rotate as long as I've seen a small number of examples of gears rotating. So gears pretty much always rotate. 
So I think you could start looking at bringing in uh, like small scan notations of models that we have actually full CAD models for, and then bring in larger image collections so they're easier to capture. Um, I, th I thought also, you know, the nice thing about those CAD models is actually itself gives you a lot of constraint because, you know, by assuming, you know, you see, so sure, there are a lot of ambiguity if things are occluded, but isn't the case that the knowledge of those CAD models actually help you resolve those ambiguities because, you know, you're seeing a lag of a chair, you know, there are sort of chair, chair has four lags and, you know, even if I'm not seeing there, I don't know if there's a lag there, I know there must be a lag there because that's the knowledge of those, you know, CAD models it actually helps you address those ambiguities. I see, that makes sense. Okay, so James has a question. If B reps as a representation for CAD programming state generalize as well, does it make sense to design domain specific languages specifically for the task of learning structure from CAD? Mm, I suppose learning structures from CAD programs. I guess this question is more like for potentially for both or for Ben because um, yeah, I guess B reps learning was a topic that you just uh, discussed. Yeah, I thought this is for Ben. So <laughs> all right, so I mean, I thought it's like that you know CAD specification languages are already kind of a very domain specific language for generating these these some um, europe programs like i guess the question is like do i guess i'm not sure if the question is saying like do we want to you know try to simplify the language to have like a dsl that is uh clear for learning um which is, is actually kind of what what a lot i think a lot of these um at least these, these techniques are, are already doing where they're taking some language like, like CSG trees and you know, looking at a subset of that. Um, oh, so I think he clarified that uh, he meant as opposed to learning a specific kind of CAD design language um, that was used in like, for example, AutoCAD and uh, Oh, so like having scripts, a DSL that like having generalizes another... between the different languages. Okay, yes. I see. Um, I think that is that's a reasonable from an academic approach for sure. Like these languages do have a lot of similarities usually. Um, uh, especially on the modeling side, especially there are there's a kind of a common subset of operations that most of them have. Most of them will have extrude operations, chamfer operations, boolean operations. Um, when you get to the um, kind of the mating side, some of these more like task specific things, that's when they really start diverging. Um, like you know, how do you model, how do you model materials? Um, Every, every system is actually very different how it does the constraint systems for how parts interact with each other. So that that is that gets less easy to design a specific DSL that kind of generalizes over. Um, but yeah, I think from, from the research point of view, it makes a lot of sense to like create a, create a single target. Um, but if you're trying to do something that's you can put out in the world and practice uh, right away, it's, it's I think only the modeling side is, is really easily targetable that right now. Uh, the, the, the geometry modeling side, I should say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think maybe I'll ask one last question before we end for today. Um, so I know that before we turned into, I guess, 3D CAD uh, tools, um, there are also like people who design just in uh, 2D uh, views of like, Catting. Um, I'm wondering, would those kind of designs still be useful as like a data source for learning CAD? Um, 100%. I think those are necessary, actually. And there's been a lot of good work recently, um, especially like out of Ryan Adams Group at Princeton, for example, has done a lot of work recently, like building from the ground up. Because if you remember when you kind of watched that view of it, the, the video of someone catting, they all started from the 2D representations. That's kind of how all these models are built up from. And so if you really understand, if you want to understand like the bottom much approach, maybe you need to understand how things are built on the 2D level. Um, and also the, the BREP data structures actually do generalize to 2D. Um, 
So you can just not connect faces in three dimension, just keep them in a plane. And that is kind of how these things are represented. Um, the other thing that I, I didn't really get into is that these constraints, we talked about constraints on the, the part pair level, but it's also constraints exist um, the, on the level of the, uh, the elements as well. And that is how this geometry is defined usually. Oh, these lines are constrained to be perpendicular. Um, so like that. So like that will scale too. Okay, then I think uh, we will end here for today. Thank you very much, both speakers and uh, everyone who asked questions and joined the discussion. Um, we will uh, like invite uh, people to join the same meeting room for uh, more discussion with the speakers afterwards. Um, and yeah, thank you for watching today's live stream.